imagine 30 years ago, Americans didn't even eat goat cheese. I'm Allison Hooper, co-founder of Vermont Creamery. I was an intern on a farm in France when I was in college. I wandered up to Vermont and I met my business partner, Bob Reese. This is where the business started. At the time, all good cheese came from Europe. Here we were, the two of us each had $1,200 and we were gonna start this business. I mean, what were we thinking, right? 12 years ago, we had the good fortune of attracting French interns. I googled Creme Fresh USA and then a friend of me say, there is that place, like it's called Vermont and it looks like France and they make cheese over there. So we're gonna go inside here, which is the fresh cheese make room. It was supposed to be a two month internship, but I fell in love with the place and the people. Bob and I have mentored her to go from being an intern to being our general manager. My name is Adeline Girard. I'm the general manager at Vermont Creamery. It's a great story. We're really proud of her. We receive goat's milk three times a week. We connect the silo all the way to the pipe and then we send it to cheese making. So it's pasteurized, then set in a maturation tank where we add bacteria. The bacteria are gonna produce flavor and acidity. It's like wine making, the longer the better. And what we do is we take the curd to those cheesecloth here. Drain it so the whey comes out of the curd and we obtain a firmer texture. And then we're gonna shape it into little logs. Within 24 hours, it's at Blue Apron's warehouse, fresh from the farm within two weeks. past 10 years has been really focusing on our capacity to keep up with the demand. So voila, fresh goat cheese from Vermont Creamery. What hasn't changed is the culture. It really feels like a family. This is my son, Miles. My name is Miles Hooper. This is Ayersbrook Goat Dairy. With the need to stimulate milk production, we've started a farm to show best practices, develop very good genetics, and try to entice farmers to want to milk goats. We are very focused on the vision of preserving family farms in Vermont. I love the goats because they seem to just want to play all day. They're just fun. Once the animals are milked, the milk then goes into the bulk tank and goes up to Vermont Creamery in Websterville to be made into Chev and everything you can imagine. Terroir means taste of place. It means that everything is connected between the producer, the maker, and the consumer. And when you eat a piece of cheese or drink a glass of wine from the region, you can taste the landscape, the people, the culture, and the passion. But when you try goat cheese, it should be very clean, very fresh, and the texture should be creamy. You don't need to put a lot to create an instant, wow, what's, what's on that pizza? What Blue Apron is delivering is the best ingredients to be turned into creative new recipes. We want everybody to experience great food and know that it's coming from a good source. I, what I have is um, about 12 lessons or little notes to self um, that we've developed over the years. So we're going to really kind of roll it back a little bit. Um, and hopefully some of you, some of these things will resonate with you. Um, some of the things that we've learned over 30 years of being in business. Um, the good news is that there are 12 of them and you can tick them off and get closer to lunch. <laughs> okay, so here we go. You good? As crime novelists concede, once you've got motive, opportunity, and weapon are easy. Lesson one, think about serendipitous accidents, formative events, identify your motive, and let it be your guide. During a junior year of college in Paris, I spent the summer in Brittany with Jean and Lilio Braz on their organic dairy of 14 cows, 40 goats, half a dozen hogs, and several score of free-range chickens. Life on this hard scrabble farm, though I didn't know it at the time, was perhaps the most formative of my adult life. Both the cows and the goat's milk was converted into a number of fresh and aged goat cheeses. The very cheeses are the basis of our product line at Vermont Butter and Cheese Company, now Vermont Creamery. The byproduct from cheese making, the way it was fed to the pigs, the entire pig was used to make various kinds of charcuterie, saucisson, and pâtés. We trucked cheeses and charcuterie to several farmers markets along the coast 
and at a large organic market in Paris. I spent my time working with the goats, moving pastures, milking and making cheese. It was summer, so a lot of time was spent loading and unloading hay wagons and preparing for farmers' markets. Theirs was a marginal existence. Family life, however, was rich. There was a strong sense of purpose, and because we were raising food, great importance was given to the daily rituals of mealtime. The French know where their food comes from, and they are connected to the working rural landscape. Here, I learned the intrinsic value of terroir, the relationship between place and culture and food, an idea that wouldn't come to the United States for another 20 years. After working as a herd person for a large goat farm in New Jersey, I moved to Vermont. My grandmother had lived in Barn in Vermont, so I had a connection to this place as a child, where at the time there were more cows than people. It seemed like a good place to make cheese. Fast forward to Vermont Department of Agriculture, where I was working in the Dare Lab, and then marketing director for Lamb Promotion and Fruits and Vegetables, Bob Reese, was organizing the first ever Vermont Products Banquet, a promotional dinner to celebrate all the great foods that are produced here in Vermont. Chef Anton Flory and his daughter, Etienne, is at this, uh, up there somewhere, there she is. Um, at the top notch in Stowe, wanted Bob to find him some goat cheese to serve with the lamb. Of course, Bob is thinking, what is goat cheese? And where am I gonna find that? Remembering somebody was in France and made cheese, he said, ah, oh, Chef, I can get you the cheese and we'll get her to make you some cheese, no problem. So as a producer, I got myself invited to the banquet found myself sitting at a table with Bob and Sandy Reese when a few of the chefs came over with their business cards inquiring about hey, how they too might buy some cheese. I thought, oh boy. Um, it was Bob's wife, Sandy, who joked and said, oh, Bob, you and Allison should start a cheese business. So Bob and I sort of sized each other up and shrugged and thought, okay, here we go. We started our business. It was actually serendipitous. My dream of being a in a cheese business was coming into focus, and for Bob, he had just completed an MBA and was chomping for an opportunity to test the reality of some sort of base venture. Bob and I already had a strong desire to do this, so it was the earlier events in our lives that set the stage, not the dinner itself. And so when times got tough in the business and our sense of purpose felt muddled, by revisiting the past, we occasionally got clear about the future. We wanted to make some awesome cheese. Lesson two, a little market research can be a dangerous thing. Trust your gut. We organized the management team and completed all of our market research in one evening. <laughs> Absolutely. We had passion and motive. Yes, we needed to do our homework and make some assumptions. Well, 1984 market research would have told us that there was no market for goat cheese, much less esoteric cultured products like cultured butter, creme fraiche, and mascarpone. One couldn't readily buy it in a retail store, and besides, Americans would simply wouldn't eat or ask for products if they couldn't pronounce the name. When starting out, you have to be a little loose and the license to be a little reckless and irrational. Thirty years ago, the dairy farmers in my valley thought I was tilting at windmills. The idea of making milking goats and then making cheese out of that milk, I can see, was a little preposterous. Now, thirty years later, when we have an awful lot to lose, we can get a little paralyzed with some of our decisions. Today, we, real, we rely on data and return on investment to guide our business decisions. So, okay, sure, listen to the research, run all the spreadsheets, but don't let them stifle an idea that feels right in your gut. We certainly didn't overthink the brand and spend a lot of energy on our positioning and communications strategy. One day I was making uh, cheese in the milk house and I had one of these portable phones and Bob called me and said, okay, so I have to go to the um, Secretary of State's office and we have to come up with a company name, register that. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so he's thinking, okay, well, how about um, Vermont butter and cheese because um, we're in Vermont and we're making cheese and we're going to make butter. I'm thinking, oh, great, that sounds great. And I said, oh, and let's call it a company so that when we go to the bank, they'll take us seriously. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Lesson three, dream, but don't be a dreamer. We all have to live in the real world. Now, the real world can be a harsh place to do business for someone who marched around the foothills of the Alps with a herd of goats, and distribution than an unrefrigerated de chevaux of chev aged to perfection on route to the French Riviera. Now, the world became very real for Bob and me as we each contributed $1,200 in cash to start our business. 
United Church of Christ had a small revolving ag loan fund. Their improbable, generous $4,000 loan was enough to leverage a loan of $10,000 from the Randolph National Bank. The bank president, Ray Gray, asks, do people eat goat cheese? We said, oh, no, no, no. But this is awesome. They're going to love this. Everybody's going to eat this. Um, well, where are you going to get the milk? Oh, we're in Vermont. There are farms everywhere. People are going to make milk for us, for sure. So the bank loan purchased a boiler to pasteurize milk in the Brookfield Milk House. We cajoled backyard 4 H goat breeders to get a license to sell milk. We insulated the bed of a tattered Toyota pickup with blue board. I drove from White River to St. Johnsbury to Richburg, picking up 10 to 20 gallons of milk from each farm twice a week to make cheese. So goat cheese sales were sluggish at the Norwich <laughs> Farmer's Market. In 1984, people didn't buy cheese at farmer's markets, and they definitely didn't buy goat cheese. From day one, we had to create cash in the business to pay our farmers and make our loan payments. We couldn't wait for goat's milk supply to catch up with our hope for demand, so we added a cow's milk product, Grand Fresh. The early marketing plan was pretty rudimentary, create cash to stay in business. <laughs> there were days and years when it felt like staying in business was the only reason for being in business. <laughs> Sorry to say that the social mission was pretty low on the list of priorities. We were 15 years into the business before we felt some latitude to make the variety of cheeses that I remember making and eating in France. If you have lemons, make lemonade. We use the limited resources of the moment to keep a bigger vision for the long term. Lesson four, quality is everything, given your best effort. We make stuff. We make cheese. Our stuff implies a certain directness and irrefutability. It keeps us honest. That is the good news. The bad news is that being in the business of making real stuff is hard. In this business of making food specifically, you have four big problems to solve. Taste, consistency, shelf life, and safety. What is the integrity of my ingredients? Is this, this is a great, but can I make this tomorrow? Now that I've done all this, can anyone afford to buy it? Getting two of the four is easy. Getting all four is tricky and just plain takes sustained effort with a lot of mistakes being fed to the pigs. In the early years, we were not the ship-shape, audited, A-rated creamer we are today. Quality calamities were more frequent and devastating in the early years. They made us aware of two things, our daily vulnerability as a company and the importance of our business relationships, not only with our customers, but our competitors, bankers, suppliers, colleagues, and friends in the community. It's lucky. We never lost a single distributor. Today our quality control is excellent and our cheeses are better than ever. Take care of your customers and colleagues, give them your best. And for us, this niche of Vermont foods or goods and services of any kind here is too small and expectations are too high to provide anything less. You can get away with mediocrity for a moment, even two, but don't make it a habit. Build a quality system that will only allow a substandard product to happen by extraordinary glitch. Lesson five, stick to your knitting. Don't get distracted. It's easy to get muddled with this one, but ask yourself how to best spend your time and you get clear about what you are not pretty quick. We knew at Vermont Creamer that we're not distributors, retailers, farmers, or dot commerce. Early on, this had less to do with being disciplined and focused and more to do with the fact that we didn't have any cash to distract us from our core business of making a better cheese and getting it into more mouths. Today, we have a new and seductive opportunity a week. But we make cheese, and we won't even allow ourselves to stray too far from one family of cheeses. While this makes us antsy from time to time, it also produces a high level of expertise. Head down, duplicate quality every day, and you have a fighting chance. Lesson six. As the market changes, so will your business strategy. Go with the flow. Yes. Our cheese may not change, but consumer attitudes certainly evolve. Back then, why would a French chef in New York buy a cheese from Vermont when he could have the real thing from France? And rightly so. French goat cheeses were the best. And anything but anything imported was worth buying over an American product. With no context of artisan American-made cheeses, our survival strategy was to build credibility with the chefs. 
they would be our disciples, but the onus was on us to create the demand for products that consumers didn't even know they wanted, much less needed. Today, people want to know where and how things are made. Because you remember the um, Portlandia um, episode where you, people leave the restaurant to go meet the chicken before they eat it. <laughs> people are looking for freshness, flavor, authenticity, and safety. How ironic that in 1987, at the New York Fancy Food Show, the distributor with whom we were existing says to us, for God's sake, don't tell anyone you're making cheese at the farm. Right. <laughs> Today is the first thing you say. Local, sustainable, non-GMO transparency is expected. And we still need to create new cheeses that consumers don't yet know they want, much less need. I just said that we should stick to our eating and do what we do best. Now that said, we still have to go with the flow. Who would have thought that the demand for goat cheese would have exploded? In Vermont, we are all challenged to meet increased demand for excellent cheese every day. We need to make sure that our growth is sustainable, thoughtful. We need to assure that our farm suppliers are thoughtful and sustainable. How do we do this? Lesson seven, be audacious, build value, and talk about it. We buy milk from 12 goat farms in Vermont, as well as a cooperative in Ontario. Globally, demand for milk is growing faster than the supply. While milking goats is not our core competency, it was clear that in order to simulate milk production and attract new farmers, we had to demonstrate the viability of such an enterprise. Simply put, farmers won't choose goat farming if they can't make a profit. And the existing farms won't grow if they don't have the margin and working capital to do so. As much as we increase the milk price, the challenges of operating a modern dairy were tough and in need of new energy. We decided to get back into farming ourselves and feel the pain right alongside our producers. While we don't pretend to be experts at farming, we've had some experience in figuring stuff out and getting as much help from experts along the way. Now, if you want to live on the edge, get yourself a farm. <laughs> if you're an entrepreneur at heart and yearn for a risky project to keep you awake at night, get yourself a farm. <laughs> the search for a farm was short. Cut to the chase inquiry to Carol and Perry Hodgson of Randolph, asking if they were ready to retire and sell their iconic first farm out of the village, produced a matter of fact, yep, let's talk. We drained about all we could from the creamery coffers without sending our bankers walking. We had the good fortune of garnering the support of three important Vermont foundations who helped us purchase the real estate. The deal was that they would hold the mortgage for 10 years and convey the farm to Ayersburg Goat Dairy provided that we raise additional capital. More patient investor angels loaned us the capital to build a new barn and buy the foundation herd. This shaggy dog story is nothing more than code for how impossible it is for young wannabe farmers to purchase a farm, much less have enough working capital to see their way to success. It is indeed sobering, reminding us of the early days of trying to make a profit from cheese making. And so we started. A bit of rigor in the business planning, operational efficiencies, and having the best genetics and nutrition program are crucial to success. We gathered goat kids from reputable herds across the country. We are now milking 230 goats with about 600 on the farm. In two seasons, we hope to have healthy animals available to new or existing farmers who want to start or grow their herds. We hope that dairy farmers will want to see our books and that ag students will want to live and work at the farm. Are we making some assumptions and hoping that real Vermonters do milk goats? So when um, our son Miles was on the, on the video was uh, welding the parlor for the new barn, we would get, the, the contractor works for dairy farmers all around the state and they would, these big farm families, you know, important dairy farmers, they would come by the barn and they'd say, oh, we're not here to see the goats. I said, we're here to talk to Robert. And Miles would be like, okay. And they'd be looking around, they'd say, so what's the uh, milk to feed ratio on, uh, and Miles would say, I thought you were interested in the goats. Oh, yes, no, we, we're, we're dairy farmers. We're, we're serious farmers. We don't, uh, we're not interested in the goats. <laughs> 
So um, they continue to come around. <laughs> so not only is this a demonstration for the next generation of farmers, but also for our customers. We can't emphasize enough the value of what we do every day on a farm, all of which defends the cost of the milk and the cost of the cheese. We currently buy enough milk outside of Vermont from about 4,000 goats. To replace that milk, we would need to keep about 2,000 acres of land in agriculture in Vermont. We need the milk. We have new farms to populate. We have to make it work. Nothing would make me happier than to know that we helped to stimulate a new brand of agriculture in Vermont. Lesson eight, company culture is not just in the cheese. Building value in the cheese not only relates to excellent milk, but also the rigor of the operations of the staff that is fully engaged every day. It has taken years to achieve, and much is, much is attributable to Adeline Drewer and our general manager who leads the creamery team, who's here today, you met her earlier today. Having achieved an A rating on our third party audit for quality and safety, the staff had experienced goal setting and success and was ready to go a little further. Three years ago, we increased our creamery capacity. It was a dream project, on time, on budget, but complicated as we didn't miss a day of cheese making. We installed some technology widely used in France to drain our cheese curd. The operating improvements allowed us to pass an 8% increase in the price of goat's milk to the farmers at a time when grain prices were through the roof. After many months of construction, dust and concrete flying, working under some difficult conditions, it all worked. I couldn't help but wonder how employees were thinking about such changes in the company. I mean, it was a big nut. Where does this money come from? Bob and Allison? Was increased efficiency going to cost jobs? It was clear that we needed to engage the staff in understanding how our business expands and how their work can affect the finance of the operation in a more meaningful way. While we were ce celebrating some banner years, we live with risk every day. Without all eyes on the operation at all times, margins could slip easily. We hired our friend Ari Wideswick from Zingman's Deli in Ann Arbor to teach us open book management. All employees stop their work for a 30-minute huddle once a week and report on metrics that they track continuously. All the operational data is posted on a public whiteboard in our warehouse. Everything from yield on milk, water usage, electricity, staff energy, and social media followers are recorded. It gives the warehouse folks a glimpse of the cash flow of slow accounts receivable and the marketing people to see the effects of a high bacteria count on cheese quality. Making employees aware of and accountable for the numbers as well as most any targeted improvement in the business not only resulted in savings but also in creating a more meaningful workplace dedicated to a better creamery community. We tracked the cheese technology to reduce our shrinkage, saving over $400,000 annual. We reduced our water usage by a third while increasing our production by 10%. We added 28% in square footage of manufacturing while increasing, uh, while um, stabilizing our electricity use. As we tracked, we improved, and the staff shared in the savings with a larger annual bonus. Lesson nine, find your strategic partners, people who need you, and ask them for help. In 1997, Bob and I received the Small Business Administration Award from Vermont. We were expected to throw a party for ourselves, and so we held the first cheesemaker festival at Sher Shelburne Farms, pairing up 19 cheesemakers and 19 chefs. That was actually Pat Heffernan's idea. Pat <laughs> many of the 600 plus guests commented that they didn't know there were this many cheesemakers in Vermont. He said, duh. <laughs> the idea of organizing the Vermont Cheese Council was right in our face, almost too easy. We happen to live in a state where the high cost of production challenges us to do things a little differently here. How does a small cheesemaker tell his or her story? We collaborate. We pool our limited resources to improve our businesses and make better cheese. We create a regional identity for Vermont cheese with a vision that is vibrant and collegiate. When I traveled uh, early on when we started around the country to do sales and so forth, um, people would say, wow, you guys are doing great things in Vermont. Really? What are we doing? I don't know, but it's really great. <laughs> As a spiritual friend. 
Um, like the wine industry of Northern California, Vermont cheesemakers have been successful in positioning our cheeses as the grand cru of American <coughs> cheese. We are the envy of other regions because we have worked together with state government and higher education. Awareness, great press, and demand have followed. The Council of 12 Charter Members has grown to over 50, and individual cheesemakers, many of whom are scaling to find their sweet spot to sustainability, have all benefited from our mutual success. And the, um, the, uh, at the, uh, the ceremony at Sterling Farms where we got our award, you know, we gave the governor go, baby go, and Senator Leahy was there, and he was all very joyous, and I marched up to the podium, and I was feeling very confident, and I said, Vermont's going to be the Napa Valley of cheese. And I was sort of silently heard this sort of guffaw, like people, are you kidding me? That's a joke, right? And I, it was at that moment I thought, oh my god, what have I said? You know, this is, this is terrible. And now, of course, if I had a dollar for every time I heard that, it would be great. Um, lesson 10, take care of Vermont. It's our most valuable asset. On the eve of the 1996 New Hampshire primary, NPR host Linda Wertheimer interviewed some New Hampshire and Vermont business owners. She commented that the buzz is that Vermont is a bad place to do business. I said, well, the New Hampshire Butter and Cheese Company just doesn't resonate. <laughs> I joined the founding board of BBSR to hang out with like-minded business owners where it was safe to express my personal tension for reasonable and more progressive public policy. I happily testified at the steakhouse to raise the minimum wage, advocate for family leave, sick leave, against parent parental notification, and try to provide some balance that protecting the environment and helping working people wouldn't put us all out of business. Thankfully, Vermont has a land use planning law, Act 250, and a robust land trust. Having been an Act 250 permit seeker, I can say that because we trade on the working landscape of Vermont, we are happy to defend the law. Early in the conversation about diversified agriculture, Montpelier was a long way from a bi-local economic development strategy. Twenty years ago, in 1995, BBSR scoured the State House to establish a new economic development model that promoted natural resource-based businesses, uh, forestry, and agriculture renewable energy. And I see Bruce, he was with me with that, and um, certainly Pat um, Heffernan. So Ellen Kaler's Sustainable Jobs Fund sought to grow an economy unique to Vermont rather than luring companies to Vermont with the promise of a tax holiday. I recall being in Governor Dean's office as we tried to get the idea into his budget and he put his feet up on the coffee table and praised us for our visionary idea, a nice way of saying, this is so not going in my budget. <laughs> Against all odds, we managed to cajole the House and Senate that a matter of public policy, that one dollar invested in these sectors would leverage two dollars of private investment and it was good for Vermont. Sustainability was a new word in the Vermont vernacular. The point is that what seems so progressive fringe and not a part of the real Vermont economy is normal today. Championed by the Farm to Plate Initiative and Paul Costello's Vermont Council on Rural Development's Working Lands Program, the very idea that an owner of an artisan cheese company would assert that her company was a perfect example of a sustainable business was an unpersuasive argument. After all, artisan cheese was but a cottage industry. <coughs> How could we have anticipated 20 years ago the groundswell, nationally and internationally, of demand for food that satisfies not only the pure enjoyment of deliciousness, but also the desire for authenticity and integrity? All the efforts of our state and our organizations from Act 250 to a Housing Conservation Trust Fund, Vermont Natural Resources Council, VPIRB, Rural Vermont, NOFA, Vermont Fresh Network Land Trust, and all the tables back there you have all conspired to create this breadbasket of goodness. While being first is slow, we can all watch with anticipation new agricultural sectors emerge. Cider, beer, value-added meat, charcuterie, even goat meat. After all, it's not an accident that we're not seeing this flurry of activity in New Hampshire. <laughs> Less, lesson 11, almost there, folks. 
Um, inventory your best asset. Working moms make great business leaders. Great to see Sarah up here with the baby on her head. In my 30th year of business, having started at age 24, I feel like I have lived many lives through the business. As a single, driven, know-nothing, wannabe entrepreneur, a married mother of three toddlers under two and a half, knowing nothing to know that I was an overextended entrepreneur. And now, happily married to a great guy, Don Hooper, mother of three wonderful young men, Miles, Sam, and Jay, looking for balance entrepreneur. In the event that the cabin loses pressure, we are told to apply our own oxygen before helping the person next to us. As mothers, we are reminded that if we are stressed and overworked, we can't be loving parents and spouses. Why would this rule be any different for our business? So how do we do this? In the early years of motherhood, we do everything for our kids. We nurture them and we control their lives. Our kids grow up and they start to do things on their own. In order to fully enjoy them as people and love them unconditionally, we have to let them go. In the early years of the business, we do everything for our business. We nurture it and we control it. And at some point, the business grows up a bit and it has its own identity, personality, even mission. We have to let it go. Today, my job is to attract the best talent I can find. I am a mediocre seat of the pants manager and the business has long outgrown my dilettante skill set. I have successfully replaced myself with people who are far more expert and confident than I. I admit that it takes a little getting used to. And as my husband will ask, and what is the problem? What more would you want? I've put up a good fight. Relinquishing control and giving credit and responsibility to others around me has actually reinforced my foundation in the brand and rejuvenated my commitment to myself and the things that I care about. I admit that I'm blessed with the choice of how I want to be in the business and what I want to do there. That freedom didn't come without some cost and rite of passage. Though busy and as frenetic as ever, I am steady and trust our good common sense. So we must give ourselves oxygen and space to curate a legacy for what we have put together modestly, luckily, in our peak years of confidence. Lesson seven, last one, folks. EBITDA is not a legacy. Last year at this conference, I attended a workshop on B Corp. I immediately thought that this would be a way to engage my creamery and management to learn about the rigors of social responsibility. Adelie Drewart and Matt Rees worked hard to complete the assessment. By design, the assessment motivated us to review and update our employee policies. We also realized that we had operated our business for many years Based on values of respect and basic fairness to farmers, employees, and other stakeholders, we had never formally established a mission for the company beyond making great cheese, making our customers and farmers happy, and creating a meaningful workplace. All good, but too myopic if we are to truly be responsible as a corporate citizen and consumer of the planet. We barely passed the assessment. <laughs> I doubt that when Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change you want to see, he was thinking about a branding opportunity. <laughs> that said, good for Yola and B Corp for getting the conversation started and providing safety for businesses around the world to participate in the change they want to be. Great for Andrea and her BBSR staff for setting the gold standard of getting us into the public policy arena where we get our hands dirty. We have been spoiled to grow up in the most progressive business community in the country and probably the world here in Vermont. Passing the B Corp assessment is the easy part. The real work is to exemplify sustainability and social justice in the minds of our employees. Of our 53 creamery employees, I only said we had 58, but those are some salespeople. If I stop any one of them in the warehouse and ask, dude, how does it feel to be a B Corp? Through no fault of their own, I might get a blank stare. <laughs> Engaging employees in the business strategy goals and daily details of open book managers, management sorry, is where we can begin to build community and enduring success. I can't help but hope and believe that reaching for risk and finding success in both the long-term goals of one step forward, two back, two forward, and one back helps us to embrace change as something hopeful and worth going for. Success, however small, builds confidence. 
Confidence helps us to overcome our fears. Maybe it increases our, our awareness of the things that we can affect outside of the four walls of our creamery. I'm not going to lie. Vermont Creamery employs a working class, blue collar group of awesome people who work very hard. They will work all weekend without complaint as long as they get to Thunder Road, get their deer, and drive the sled to work. While they don't relish the free goat cheese at their disposal, they are incredibly prideful of what they do and all the accolades and awards that we've received. They are loyal to the company and grateful to be adopted by the Vermont Creamery family. Now most of them think I'm a nut riding my bike to work, having a tantrum when we buy bottled water for a meeting, picking through the trash for a recycling faux pas. Now I may be a liberal, but I'm also a libertarian at the Creamery. When I hear Rush Limbaugh over the airwaves in the warehouse, see a Sports Illustrated swimsuit calendar in the shop, and I can park my used Prius next to an F-250 with a bumper sticker that says, hybrids are for douchebags. <laughs> I'm up for the challenge. <laughs> Testifying as Allison Hooper in this day house is no longer good enough. I need to engage Vermont Creamery as a company and brand to exemplify sustainability, good health, carbon reduction, social justice, and making the world a better place. We have a young staff. They are all having kids. I worry for those kids and the planet they will inherit. I shudder to imagine a future grandchild who asks, Grammy, you knew the planet was burning up and you did nothing? I won't have it. I worry about the increased disparity of wealth in our society. It can't be good for Vermont, small businesses, and working families and farmers. If we are successful in engaging a staff to pay attention to the cheese and have a high level of accountability for their success at work, maybe we could engage them to feel like they're making a difference in the world around them. For all of us, 30 years seems like a long time to do one thing. The work has changed with lots of tough love. Formative events, trusting the gut, living in the real world, quality's number one, stay focused, go with the flow, add value, create community, collaborate, don't pay Vermont, lead with compassion, look beyond EBITDA. We may be successful in conquering many business challenges, but then if you're like me, you might still ask, so what? We are only making cheese. We're not solving world peace. Have I left the world a better place? Did we help a farmer to keep their land working? Did we help an employee engage in the community? Will I regret risks that I didn't take? A hand that I didn't take or give? A relationship neglected? Love that I didn't express? At the risk of ending this talk with a bunch of questions, we'll end with a quote, and please indulge me because I'm sure most of you are no Edward Abbey's exuberance. One final paragraph of advice, do not burn yourselves out. Be as I am, a reluctant enthusiast, a part-time crusader, a half-hearted fanatic. Save the other half of yourselves for your lives, for pleasure and adventure. It's not enough to fight for the land. It is even more important to enjoy it while you can. While it's still here, get out there and hunt and fish and mess around with your friends Ramble out yonder and explore the forest, climb the mountains, bag the peaks, run the rivers, breathe deep of that yet sweet and lucid air, sit quietly for a while and contemplate the precious stillness, the lovely, mysterious, and awesome space. Enjoy yourselves. Keep your brain and your head and your head firmly attached to the body, the body active and alive, and I promise you this much. I promise you. This one sweet victory over our enemies, over those desk-bound men and women with their hearts in a safe deposit box and their eyes hypnotized by desk calculators. I promise you this, you will outlive the bastards. Yeah. <laughs>